My name is Thad Graham. I am the education specialist with the Victim Services Program. And today we are going to be looking at the question that we in the domestic violence uh, field hear constantly. Um, it's something that we hear all of the time. You know, when I'm out in public, I'm out talking at places, individuals will ask me this constantly. Thad, why do they stay? Why do individuals in a domestic violence situation stay? Thad, why don't they just leave? Why don't they just pick up and leave? Thad, if that was happening to me, I would be gone. The first sign of a domestic violence situation, the first sign of violence, I would be out of there. We hear that from parents as well. Thad, if that was my son, if that was my daughter, I would have them out of that situation so fast, it would make your head spin. So today, we are gonna look at the number one question that we hear constantly when working with domestic violence victims. When we hear from individuals who hear, what I do for a living, well, why do they stay? We're gonna look at that today. Like I said, my name is Thad Graham. I work with the Victim Services Program here at Family Services Incorporated. Our mission is to provide resources to build healthy relationships and promote personal growth. Our vision, of course, is to engage with communities to meet the needs of their most vulnerable. Of course, a little trigger warning here, we are gonna be talking about domestic violence. So please make sure that you take your own, you know, mental health into consideration. Make sure that that is what you are looking for, what you are um, taking care of first. Um, this may be triggering to some of you, so please make sure you're taking care of yourselves. Objectives for today, we are gonna define domestic violence and its synonyms, discuss why domestic violence victims stay with their abusers, and of course, discuss the FSI Victim Services Program and its services. So we're gonna start off with a few facts. When we look at domestic violence, we have to remember that it is happening everywhere. It is happening here in Blair County. You know someone that it is happening to. You know someone who is currently a victim of domestic violence and you may not even know it. On average, nearly 20 uh, people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner in the United States. During one year, this equates to more than 10 million women and men. One of the things we also have to remember is it is not just women who are the victims. Yes, one in three women and one in four men have experienced some form of physical violence by an intimate partner a woman is more likely to be the victim of domestic violence, but a man can be the victim as well. We often think of these victims of domestic violence as you know, a perfect victim. It's someone who is crying at the hospital because they were just physically assaulted. They have that black eye, they have a bruised and bloody lip, but that's not what all victims look like. And we have to expel those myths and those cliches of what a victim is. A victim can be anybody, and a victim can act in any way that they feel is appropriate for their trauma response. So one in three women and one in four men have experienced some form of physical violence by an intimate partner. This is often forms of violence that we don't even think about when we consider talking about domestic violence. This is things like a slap or a shove, you know, something that you may just think is nothing but it is physical violence, and it is physical violence by an intimate partner. One in four women and one in seven men have experienced physical abuse from an abusive intimate partner. This is what we would consider classic domestic violence, the black eye, the bruised lip, etc. One in seven women and one in 25 men have been injured by intimate partner violence. This is something we are seeing here in Blair County um, specifically with COVID, with COVID over the last, you know, 
year and a half, two years, however long it's been, it all runs together at this point. But one of the, the trending increases we have seen is the amount of violence and the severity of violence of intimate partner violence of that domestic abuse. It has increased dramatically since the start of COVID, um, the level of violence used against intimate partners and the severity of that violence. On a typical day, there are more than 20,000 phone calls placed to domestic violence hotlines nationwide. Um, I can tell you our helpline advocate, Brittany, um, is in the same office area as I am, and her phone is ringing a lot. Her phone rings a lot on a daily basis. She is a very, very, very busy person. So what is domestic violence? Domestic violence is a pattern of coercive behavior used by one person to gain power and control over an intimate or familial relationship. One of the things we often think about when we think of domestic violence is that it is just between a man and a woman who are in an intimate relationship. But domestic violence can take many forms and it doesn't just have to be that intimate relationship. It can be between, you know, a mom and a son. It can be a son who is abusing his mother. It can be any relationship in that family where one person is trying to obtain and gain and keep power and control over another individual. I have used many terms so far, and I will continue to use them interchangeably to describe and discuss this topic of domestic violence or intimate partner violence. DV, domestic abuse, domestic battery, intimate partner violence, IPV, are all different terms that you will hear me and many people use, but we're all talking about the same thing. We're talking about someone gaining power or control over another individual using coercive behavior. Domestic violence can be characterized by many types of abuse. Any or all types of these violence and or abuse may occur in a domestic violence situation. Remember, each situation is different. Each situation is its own entity. Um, no situation is gonna be the same, um, but any of these forms of abuse can and could or will be used in a domestic violence situation. Looking at emotional abuse, physical abuse, stalking, sexual violence, financial abuse, verbal, religion, or litigation abuse. All of these are tools used by one individual to gain power and control over another. And some of them can be devastating. Oftentimes we look at just the physical violence, just the physical brute abuses and the physical violence that are used against another person. But oftentimes when looking and talking with survivors, they often say that the emotional abuse, the verbal abuse are the, are the abuses and the abuse and the trauma that sticks with them for years later. When it comes to stalking, being stalked by an intimate partner makes a woman more likely to be murdered by that intimate partner. Oftentimes we look as, at stalking as not a big deal, as something that you know isn't a concern. In some movies nowadays, stalking is used as a way for one individual to get the other person to fall in love with them. It's just so cute. Isn't it lovely? But in all actuality, when it comes to being stalked most likely by a previous or current intimate partner, for the female, it often means extreme violence and death. When we look at domestic violence, of course, we look at the power and control wheel as these are the ways that individuals gain and maintain power or control over another person. And once, like we said before, it's not just that heterosexual male and female relationship. One of the most overlooked types of abuse, of course, is intimate partner violence when it comes to teen dating violence and teens. Um, it can happen, it is happening, and it is often overlooked by parents and caregivers. It's something that you need to take more seriously. 
and something that we have to, you know, understand. LGBTQ plus as well, when it comes to, you know, looking at, you know, other relationships, uh, members of the LGBTQ plus community are more likely to be physically abused, to be in a violent relationship. And the ways of abuse that are used against them to keep and gain that power are slightly different. We have multiple webinars talking about this with our helpline advocate, Brittany. Um, if you are interested in more information on the power and control wheel when it comes to LGBTQ plus relationships. So why don't they just leave? Why do victims stay? That is the question that we are answering now. A victim's reason for staying with their abusers are extremely complex and in most cases are based on the reality that their abuser will follow through with the threats they have used to keep them trapped. Remember, victims have been physically abused. They have been emotionally tortured. They have been threatened to be murdered. They have had threats placed against their family and their friends and their loved ones. They are isolated and often alone. They can't reach out to their support systems. They have often no means of which to escape. They are financially isolated. They don't have often a vehicle in their name. The lease often isn't in their name. They have no means for which they can just pick up and go. And if they would leave, they've been told multiple times by their abuser that they will kill them, that they will hurt them. And statistically, that is the most dangerous time for an abuse victim is when they leave. It will take an abuse victim up to 11 different attempts to finally break free from their abuser. In each attempt, they are putting themselves at higher risk for extreme physical violence and death. 66.2% of female stalking victims reported stalking by a current or former intimate partner. 76% of women who were murdered by an intimate partner were stalked first. When they leave, they're gonna be stalked most likely by their abuser. 85% of women who survived murder attempts were stalked. 89% of femicide victims who had been physically assaulted before their murder were also stalked in the last year prior to their murder. 54% of femicide victims reported stalking to the police before they were killed by their stalkers. 65% of all murder suicides are perpetrated by intimate partners. And 96% of murder suicide victims are female. We have to remember that when it comes to a domestic violence situation, it is about holding power and control over another individual. When the victim is leaving, when that survivor is attempting to leave, the abuser is losing the power and control they hold over that individual. When they lose that power and control over that individual, they have nothing to lose. And when people have nothing to lose, they become dangerous. They will hurt or kill their children. The second most dangerous time for a victim of domestic abuse is if they are pregnant. The leading cause of death for pregnant women is often murder by the baby's father, by their intimate partner. They will hurt or kill their children. They have threatened to hurt or kill their children. And oftentimes they do it. 
I'm from Tyrone, a you know, little town in Northern Blair County. I still remember the case of the child who was beaten and choked before being murdered by his mother's boyfriend. The mother was a victim of domestic violence. The boy was trying to stand up for his mother and he was murdered. The picture of the female and her really cute, adorable baby. They were both murdered by the baby's father after she finally decided to leave the domestic violence situation. He found them and he shot them both to death. The Women in the Bottom is a survivor in a wonderful documentary called Finding Jen's Voice. I would highly recommend you watch it. Um, it is about intimate partner violence in pregnancy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Her son, her child, was murdered by her father, by the, the child's father, because he was not able to murder her. He killed the child with an ax and told the child that it was his mother's fault that he had to kill him because the mother left and he couldn't kill her. There are many, many stories of children who are hurt and killed, oftentimes by their own parents as a way to get back at or to continue to control those victims of domestic violence. I know myself, I would do anything for my children. If it meant having to stay in a domestic violence situation where I am being physically beaten and I am being abused, but I know they are safe or they are not gonna be harmed, I would do it. Most parents would. Most parents are not gonna wanna put their children into danger and would rather them live through that abuse. They will harm or kill their pets or friends or family. Uh, looks like Tina hopped off. Tina um, from the VA, her staff had a wonderful webinar um, on Monday about domestic violence, intimate partner violence and pets. And we have to remember that domestic violence victims will harm pets, friends, and other individuals. To maintain control over another individual. A recent study of intimate partner homicides found 20% of homicide victims were not the domestic violence victims themselves, but family members, friends, neighbors, persons who, were inter who intervened, law enforcement responders, or bystanders. Once again, if a victim or if the abuser has nothing to lose, they will harm anybody they can. A few years ago, there was a Huntington State Police officer who was injured, who was murdered in a domestic violence call because it was the only way for that abuser to lash out at the time and to cause harm to his abuse victim. 71% of women in domestic violence shelters report their, abused, their abuser threatened, injured, or killed a pet as a means of control. In a national survey, 85% of domestic violence shelters indicated that when that women coming to their facilities told of incidents of pet abuse. Abusers will use pets as a way to threaten and control their victims. And they will often harm or kill the pet in front of the victim as a threat that this will happen to you if you leave. This will happen to you or your children 
if you try and leave. If I can do this to this dog that I love, imagine what I can do to you. They will win custody of the children. They will ruin them financially. Last week, we had our civil lawyer on, Emily, and she did an amazing job talking about litigation abuse. Litigation abuse happens here in Blair County, and it is something that abuse victims have to worry about. Abusers will intentionally and excessively file frivolous lawsuits and motions to enforce, con to enforce contact with survivors who are compelled to return to court and face their abusers. Most common abusive litigation tactics, tactic is to deliberately run up legal expenses by filing frivolous requests and demanding excessive or irrelevant information in the discovery process in the hopes of leaving the survivor without representation. An example would be a, an abuser filing claim after claim making this victim take off work, possibly make this victim miss school to come in to the courthouse and face the abuser. The abuser doesn't even have to show up. The abuser can file for multiple requests and may not even show up themselves. But the survivor has to be there. This can cause them to become in trouble at work. It could cause them to be fired. It could cause them to lose their job, to lose their income, or to be kicked out of a school. Oftentimes, it is safer for the victim to give in to lesser demands, give in to the abuser, so they do not have to continue to confront them in court. They do not have to continue to see them and they do not have to continue to fight because they may not have the money to continue to fight. Many attorneys cannot continue to represent a survivor when faced with constant motions and court appearances, particularly if the survivor is not able to pay for the ongoing litigation. Survivors are compelled to make concessions in family law cases out of fear of navigating the complex legal system on their own. Like I said, this often leads to them giving up demands for child support or spousal support or giving into less desirable resolutions when it comes to custody, child support, spousal support, etc. Often it is safer to stay. One of the things we have to look at is how can a victim leave when they are being threatened with their lives, their children are being threatened, their friends are being threatened, their pets are being threatened, or their livelihood is being threatened. It is often easier for a victim to stay and we have to understand that. We can't hold that against them. The victim in violent relationships know their abuser best. They know to the extent they will go to make sure that they can have and maintain control over that victim. That victim knows what that person is capable of more than anybody. And that victim knows the safest route for them and their children. In truth, we do need to stop blaming the victim. When we ask the question, why don't they leave? Why are they staying? Why is she staying? We are blaming the victim. We are giving in to victim blaming. And in all honesty, we need to flip the script. We need to start asking the abuser why they are using violence, why they have to hold power or control over another individual. Why they are hurting this person that they supposedly love. Why are they willing to hurt their children? 
why are they willing to hurt their pets? We need to stop asking the victim, stop blaming the victim, and start asking the person who is actually responsible for the abuse, the abuser, the person who is willing to use violence in a relationship, the person who is willing to do anything to maintain power or control over another individual. Some additional barriers to leaving that we see, of course, the fear that the abuser's actions will become more violent and may become lethal, lethal if they attempt to leave. Difficulties when it comes to single parenting. Religious or cultural beliefs and practices that may not support divorce or may dictate outdated gender rules and keep the victim trapped in their relationship. Um, oftentimes in small rural communities like ours, um, religion is a big reason that victims do not leave. Um, they have been taught since they are little that divorce isn't an option, that my religion says that I have to consent to whatever my husband says and that they have ultimate control. They may believe that two-parent household is better. They may have an unsupportive friend and friends and family. Remember, these victims have been isolated from friends and family, their support systems. They don't have the support systems that they used to, and that is out of design by the abuser. The victim's lack of knowledge of access to safety and support. They don't know about the offer, the services that we offer here at Victim Services and other agencies in the area. They have a fear of losing custody of their children or that their children will be hurt or killed a lack of means to support themselves. Remember, financial abuse is very common. Often these victims do not have the skills necessary um, or have never worked in their lives. They have not been allowed to work. They do not have the means to actually financially take care of themselves and their children. Even if they have worked, they often do not have access to the money that they make. They don't have access to the bank accounts and the assets are not in their name. Lack of having somewhere to go. Fear that homelessness may be their only option. We at Family Services, the Victim Services Program, no longer have a domestic abuse shelter, but we do still off offer the opportunity to house and shelter victims of domestic violence. Just because we don't have a shelter doesn't mean that we can't give them a place to stay and get them into a place of their own using the Housing First model. Some societal barriers, a victim's fear of being charged with desertion, losing custody of children or joint assets. Anxiety about a decline in living standards for their children and themselves. Like I said before, reinforcement of clergy and secular counsel counselors of saving a couple's relationship at all costs. Lack of support to victims by police officers and law enforcement <clears throat> who may treat the violence as a domestic dispute instead of a crime where one person is physically attacking another person. We do unfortunately see this sometimes in Blair County as well when it comes to civil protective orders. Officers that will look at a breach of the protection from abuse um, is not a big deal. It is a big deal. Um, these victims have been awarded you know, that protection from abuse for a reason, and it's because they fear for their lives. Dissuasion by police of the victims filing charges, um, civil protection orders not being listened to, reluctance by prosecutors to prosecute cases. This is something we do not have in Blair County. Our district attorneys are willing to prosecute and are willing to help and stand up for victims of domestic violence. Um, if you follow us on Facebook, um, I actually talked to assistant district attorneys here in Blair County um, about prosecuting domestic violence. It is a great five minute video. I highly recommend you take a look at it. Isolation from friends and families, either by jealous and or possessive abusers. And like I said, it is a way to isolate the victim and prevent them from seeking help.
societal factors that teach women to believe their identities and feelings of self-worth are contingent upon getting and keeping a man. This is something that we see even as young as small children um, who are running around, you know, at five, six, seven years of age, um, and girls are wanting a boyfriend. That's my boyfriend. You know, society has conditioned females that they need a boyfriend, which is something that we need to teach our children that isn't true. You do not need to be with someone to be happy. You can be absolutely happy just with yourself. So when it comes to the Victim Services Program, of course, our information has not changed. If you or anyone you know is a victim or has been a victim of domestic violence, you can reach out to our free and confidential helpline, 814-944-3585. Of course, you can also text it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We talked about this in the last webinar of litigation abuse but the FSI Justice Project is available for free civil legal representation to victims of domestic violence. If you or someone you know needs that civil representation, call our helpline at 814-944-3585. Of course, you can find us on social media. Like I said, the Victim Services Program has a ton of great videos up for uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, that coincide with everything we are doing here on Webinar Wednesdays. If you would like to watch any of our previous or future webinars, they are all pre-recorded, they are all recorded, um, and they are both put on our GoToStage and our YouTube. As always, there are handouts in the description, including this PowerPoint where you can simply click on the link and go to our YouTube or GoToStage to watch those videos. Of course, DVAM webinar Wednesday schedule, why do they stay? We did today. Our last and final one will be helping our heroes, domestic violence in the veteran population next Wednesday. Of course, Women Aware is back. Uh, women Aware is a free educational support group for women who have experienced domestic abuse. The group meets once a week for one and a half hours. Members can join at any time. If you would like more information on Women Aware, 814-944-3585. Once again, thank you all for your time. I am sorry about the um, audio issues at the beginning. I have no idea what happened. Um, everything was showing good on my end, but there was no sound. So I am sorry once again. I will hang out if anybody has any questions. There are, of course, handouts in the handout section for anybody that, has, uh, that would like them. Thank you all and have a wonderful Wednesday afternoon.